Um, we want to remind everybody that if you found your way here, you're welcome to participate in all the things. So we are just so happy that you are here. And whenever we talk about activities or programs or opportunities, uh, we are talking about you too. You are welcome to be a part of everything that goes on here. Um, there is a children's story this morning. So if there are children lurking somewhere in your home uh, around the middle of the service, it's kind of the start of where it would be the sermon. Um, we have this great video to tell us a history story about universalism. And uh, so if you have any kids nearby, you might want to lure them into the space halfway through. But I think we are all young at heart. And I know this story really touched me. So now um, our opening song will be led by Rebecca Patterson. The words are on the screen and we invite you to stay muted and sing along at home. Good morning, everyone. On this windy, windy morning, I listen to Rebecca and see her face, and I, I truly miss being in the choir and enjoying that experience. So hopefully one day we'll be able to sing as a choir again for Westwood. We wish to acknowledge that our Westwood Congregational Building is located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others, whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. In the spirit of deepening our commitment to partnership, I would like to lift up the words of Sherry Mitchell, Indigenous rights lawyer and activist. We need to be partners working together to return to a harmonized relationship with our environment, living life in kinship with the rest of creation, with all life. We need each other to fight for the preservation of vital ecosystems and a way of being that has allowed life to be sustained for tens of thousands of years. A gracious and warm welcome to all of you. We bid a special welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. We're happy you found us. The Sunday service is central to the life of this community. My name is Dawn Hunter and I use the pronouns she and her. I'm your service leader this morning and lay chaplain for Westwood. 
Our speaker at Westwood, Westwood Unitarians, Reverend Ann Barker, our musician, is Rebecca Patterson. And thank you to Alara Stephanie at Cadet and Bill Lee for their technical expertise this morning. Worship reminds us of who we are, what we value, and can be found in the lives of secularists, agnostics, and atheists, as well as those who engage in formal spiritual practice. But what many UUs share is reverence and gratitude for the wonder of nature and of being. Here together, we can realize what we can become as beings, how we want to live in partnership as stewards of the earth, and what we hope to give from our best selves to the community and to the world. We come together this morning in support of each other in our spiritual journeys, drawing on the wisdom of many religions and guided by our share, shared UU principles. We're a community open to all races, genders, sexual orientations, ages, abilities, and incomes. We search for truth everywhere, but some of our named sources include the teachings of earth-based religions, words and deeds of prophetic people, and wisdom from the world's religions, as well as the authority of our own direct experience. Let's stand or sit together this morning in strength or in fragility, holding space for each other during the difficult times in our world today, and there are many. If you are feeling troubled or ill at ease, we hope our time together brings you comfort. Thank you, Dawn. If you have a candle or a chalice nearby, now is a good time to bring it forward. And in just a moment, we'll light our shared chalices together. There are so many ways that words are strung together and then continue on their own unique journey, their meaning evolving or at least perceived in different ways by different listeners as time goes on. Our opening song was written originally in Hebrew sometime in the 20th century, expressing belief in a better tomorrow for the Jewish people. Holding that context in your hearts and minds, listen to the words once again. Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear. And the children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunderclouds will appear. Wait and see, wait and see what a world there can be if we share, if we care, you and me. how those words have gone to take on such powerful meaning for so many of the contexts that we are experiencing right now. We light our shared chalices this morning in the spirit of continuity, in the spirit of struggle, for the trials of the past and the suffering of the present and the bold creativity that it sometimes takes to have faith in the future. Blessed be. At this time in our service, we reflect on the joys, concerns, and sorrows, the changes in our lives, those who need our healing thoughts, and there are many of us. Community is deepened by sharing with each other what is in our hearts. While we enjoy some music, we invite you now to type your candles of concern or celebration into the chat box.
Um, I noticed there um, there was at least one uh, birthday mentioned in in the candles of concerns and joy. Um, so that brings me to something new that we will be doing at the end of each month is to invite everyone to type into the chat all the September birthdays you're celebrating, as well as any birthdays we have missed and you would like to name. So now I invite you to sing along with Rebecca, the happy birthday song. was great. I realized how much I missed that. Um, I now light a candle, a symbolic candle for all the birthdays we just celebrated. And I light one final candle for all the unspoken joys and concerns that we carry in our hearts. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. This community of faith is supported by gifts from our congregation and from visitors, gifts of time, talent, and financial contribution. Contributions to Westwood allow us to do and to be all the wonderful things that you love. Worship services currently online, our tremendous staff and our resources and programs. The program I would like to celebrate this morning is our minister's coffee chat with our very own virtual Ann Barker. One of my favorite elements of ministry is the opportunity to meet with people, have a coffee, and just have a visit, unscripted, unscheduled, just hang out and get to know one another better. I'd like to invite you to the minister's coffee chat. My name is Ann Barker. I serve Westwood Unitarian. If you go to our website, scroll down to the bottom of the front page to the calendar and look on Wednesday mornings, you'll see the link for Minister's Coffee Chat. Click on through and it'll take you right into our Zoom gathering. So bring your bed head, come in your pajamas if you want, bring your own beverage, and I'll see you anytime between 10 and 11 on Wednesday mornings. I look forward to meeting you there. If you would like to make a tax deductible donation to Westwood, please go to our website. There is a button at the top that will redirect you to a page full of information on the many ways you can make a contribution. So now with your screen still muted, will you please join with our choir director, Rebecca Patterson, as she sings our offering song. From you I receive to you We are people in the midst of many overlapping stories. We are witnessing and shaped by an amplification of partisan politics, a resurgence of fascism, a global resistance to any oppressive status quo, and substantial threats to fiscal and economic collapse. We are people of faith, discerning what that means amid a legitimate criticism of organized religion, living through a pandemic, learning how to navigate a reality that we didn't know, couldn't know how to prepare for, afloat in a time of uncertainty. We are self-determining, yes, and we are entirely dependent on one another. History tells us many parallel stories, some we have learned from and some not so much. 
This morning, we're going to begin with a story that speaks to survival, connection rather than division, inclusiveness, and faith. This morning, our story comes from the history of one of our two core faith traditions from universalism, and it comes to us as a gift. On Wednesday, September 30th, it will be the 250th anniversary of universalism in the United States, and some would argue in North America. So before I say more about the topic of the day, which is calling in, I invite you to relax and enjoy a story told by Liza Earl Centers, Director of Lifespan Spiritual Exploration at the Unitarian Church of Montpellier, Vermont. This story is adapted from Welcoming Home, a curriculum by Christy Olson and Jessica York, as well as Thomas Potter and John Murray's story by the Reverend Dr. John C. Morgan. This video is shared with permission. I offer you John Murray and the Winds of Change. Hello, everyone. I'm sending a special hello to any of the children watching this morning. And if they have wandered out of the room, feel free to call them back for this story for all ages. It is called John Murray and the Winds of Change. It involves some adventures at sea that they won't want to miss and some Playmobil people. So we are Unitarian Universalists. And this particular story focuses on the universalist part of our faith's history. That is because universalism in this country is celebrating a big birthday this year. It is celebrating 250 years since its beginning in 1770. Imagine a birthday cake with 250 candles on it. That would be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? Well, I don't have any presents for us to open, but I do have the wonder box for us to look inside and this will help us get started. Inside the wonder box. And if you can tell what this is, a little paper. If we put it on water, it might float. Do you have any guesses? That's right, it's a paper boat. And a boat plays a, plays a key role in the story that I'm about to tell you. The boat in the story is called The Hand in Hand. It carried a man named John Murray from England all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. He was heading to New York to start a new life. He didn't have much in his bags, but he did carry a broken heart. He hadn't always had a broken heart. He had been a passionate minister in Ireland and England. He had loved school and his family, but recently he had been fired from his job, and soon after his wife and child got sick and died. He was even put in jail for a short time because he couldn't pay his bills. Things were going from bad to worse. So he boarded a boat called the Hand in Hand to leave his old life behind and see what he could do to start over in a new country. Across the ocean was a man named Thomas Potter. Thomas was a successful farmer and deeply spiritual man. He couldn't read, but he heard the Bible when others read it aloud. And he also heard of this new idea spreading that God loved all people, not just some above others. This rang so true to him that he gathered friends and neighbors to read the Bible and to talk about this and other spiritual ideas. They met so often that his wife Mary eventually asked if they might meet outside of the house. So Thomas built a simple meeting house or chapel of sorts in hopes that a minister might come to lead them. He waited 10 long years and he prayed to God to send a minister for them. And then one day in the fall of 1770, when the leaves were beginning to change color, a heavy fog rolled in. That was before GPS for mapping, and the ship that carried John Murray ran aground in New Jersey instead of New York. John and a few others volunteered to leave the ship, go on land, and get directions and supplies. As he was walking ashore, John saw a farmhouse with a small chapel or church beside it. It belonged to Thomas Potter. Thomas Potter greeted John and gave him food, 
food for everyone on the ship, and invited John to come back and have dinner with him that night. When John came back, Thomas Potter showed him the chapel. Potter said he believed in the loving God who wanted to accept all people into heaven. John said that he believed the same thing. Thomas Potter told John that he had built the chapel and was waiting for God to send him a minister. You, John, are that minister. I have waited for you a long time. John did not want to hear this. He was not a preacher anymore, and he was determined to never preach again. Yet Thomas Potter seemed confident that John was the universalist preacher he had been waiting for, and he asked John to preach on Sunday. I can't preach on Sunday, said John, because as soon as the wind changes, my boat will set sail, and I must be on it. If the boat has not sailed by Sunday, will you preach? asked Thomas Potter. If I am still here on Sunday, I will preach, said John Murray. Now what do you think happened? Did the wind blow the sailboat away, taking John Murray with it? No, no wind blew and no ship sailed. John Murray preached that Sunday morning, September 30th, 1770, in the chapel Thomas Potter built for him many years before. And the universalist message of the power of love was good news to many who heard it that morning. It was good news for John. The winds of change blew yet again for John Murray. He now wanted to preach more than anything, and he did for many years. He did set sail later that Sunday for New York, but he returned very soon after to preach again at Thomas Potter's Chapel and many times in the following years. He traveled from Virginia all the way throughout New England to share this big new idea of a universal love for all people, no matter what mistakes you might have made. Now in the year 2020, each of us as Unitarian Universalists can continue that work of John Murray and Thomas Potter by making sure that in our families, in our congregation, and in the wider community, everyone knows the importance of each and every person, no matter our differences. Well, it has been fun sharing this story of our universalist faith with you. And I hope that you might carry this message of love for everybody into your life this week and the weeks going forward. I think I need to get these Playmobil people back to Marissa. See you next time. So I'll begin my part of the talk with um, a reading from this book, Bless the Imperfect, Meditations for Congregational Leaders. And this reading is entitled, Let the Wrong Ones In, and it's written by the UU historian, the Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie. We often speak of the mantle of leadership as involving an inheritance from the past. We sing that what they dreamed be ours to do and speak of torches given to our temporary care as they travel from the past to the future. Yet in a progressive religious tradition, this is especially challenging. Most of our personal identities and theologies would shock our religious ancestors. They did not dream us unless maybe in their worst nightmare. So who did? What legacy can be honestly invoked to sound an authentic note for progressive leadership? Somewhere along the line, someone left this tradition open for me. Someone invited me in, someone made the way for me, even though there is no equivalent for me in our forebears imagination. And when things have been bad, when I have been bad, this tradition has carried me around in my sorry little basket and given me over and over again the invitation to relationship, the invitation to be human, as human as I dare. When I am privileged to lead, I feel the power of this invitation behind me, but who issued it? In the early days of American congregationalism, membership in the church was tightly controlled. 
the covenant of membership was restricted to the saints, those who were destined for heaven and could prove it before a parsimonious clergy and a small number of pious church members. But many of the people in the pews refused this narrow view. When the minister preached about how the covenant, the very love of God and the love of the people was reserved for the elect, the people heard something different. They heard the offer of covenant extended to all who desired its embrace. Eventually, this generosity led to a different church, a church with doors held wide open, our church. And it is this spirit that I imagine speaking to our leaders saying, remind us of how for all but five minutes of our history, we have been the wrong people. Help us to identify, name, and invite all the wrong people who may in fact turn out to be right. Show us those who need our invitation to participate in a whole and holy humanity. May your leadership be one of radical hospitality and inclusion. Those are the words of Susan Ritchie. Remind us of how for all but five minutes of our history, we have been the wrong people. Help us to identify, name and invite all the wrong people who may in fact turn out to be right. I invite you this morning to reflect for a quiet moment on the ways that you may have been perceived as the wrong people. The ways that your identities, your ideas, your beliefs, your very being disrupt the status quo. If not the status quo of the present, then the status quo of the past. So reflect on how for all but five minutes of history, you have been the wrong people. How many ways do your identities threaten your existence? Or might they in the past have threatened your existence? Your gender, your heritage, your free ideas, your daring to believe that your life has value in any system that might not value you back. Our theme this year at Westwood is forward motion. What does it mean to move forward? How do we choose to move forward as people, as a congregation, as cultures, as countries, as a planet? How will we individually and collectively move reconciliation forward? How will we move equity forward? How will we move even basic safety and comfort forward? How will we move ourselves forward? Universalism takes a very clear stance on this, that all are called, that all are worthy, that all are redeemable. We've had different ways of understanding this over the years, but the core remains. A loving God would not leave anyone out. A compassionate community recognizes the inherent worth and dignity of every person. All are chosen, all are welcome. It's a foundational principle of who we are as Unitarian Universalists. And we wrestle with this. We might sometimes hear a question like, but what about Hitler? Does Hitler have inherent worth and dignity? The argument goes that we all have worth and dignity, but that there are certainly ways to lose your freedoms. That there are transgressions which, while they might be forgiven, and maybe that's why we conjure an image of God because we struggle to imagine that kind of forgiveness in ourselves. Transgressions might be forgiven, but not accepted. Behaviors that must be stopped, limits to what can be allowed if a community is to function in a way that cares for all of its inhabitants. 
I'd be lying if I said that I thought I'd ever have to deal with this in my lifetime to face down that level of vitriolic hatred. And I was ridiculously mistaken. I was unawake to the relentless burden of hatred that continues to crush so many people's lives on a daily basis. I've argued my way through so many philosophical thought experiments in school that I never expected to be living through like we are today. But here we are, and our universalist ancestors speak directly to my heart in this moment. The universalists defiantly believed that every being was a member of God's flock, that the shepherd would not let a single sheep go uncounted, and that every soul would be saved. It might not be immediate. They weren't sure how exactly redemption might be achieved for some people, but that was God's work. Their work was to do their best to live into the inheritance of love and hope that was their birthright. We don't tell the story the same way anymore in this community. We say now that every person has inherent worth and dignity and that our goal is world community with peace, liberty and justice for all. We say all are welcome here. And we say, bring your whole self to this place. Our reading this morning implied, come you who are the wrong people meaning that what you bring, even if we don't yet recognize or understand it, is welcome here. That one of our profoundly distinctive characteristics is our open door that does not demand compliance to a code. Except it does a little bit. There's still that people of goodwill bit. There's still the expectation that within your abilities, you will work with us to create and maintain that same inclusive community that welcomed you in, that welcomed me in, that welcomes the next person in. It's beautiful and wonderful, and it can be really tough because each of us, all of us will be offensive sometimes. It might be a misunderstanding or an accident. It might be an intentional, I'm at the end of my rope kind of argument. It might be the result of an impairment or really bad judgment or some kind of assault, verbal or physical or worse. The thing is, we all have times when we are wrong. The hardest part of that being wrong is that we don't always agree on what wrong is. I expect that we have a lot of agreements here about right and wrong, but psychology, morality, philosophy, even science is a mobile truth. How we raise children from generation to generation has changed dramatically. How we understand things like race and gender and culture and abuse and activism change dramatically. And it doesn't always take a generation. Sometimes it changes overnight. I remember my grandparents saying that I was lucky learning the metric system in school because they would never understand it like I would, having been immersed in imperial measures for their entire adult lives. That struck me in a really challenging way when I wrote it that our measuring system was imperial. I got the transition in grade five. And while I drive in kilometers and I shop in kilograms and grams, I have no concept of a body weight except in pounds. So I still never completely shifted. I feel that same way like my grandparents did about kids who grew up digitally literate. I can learn all kinds of electronic things, but I'm not native to the culture. I'm always catching up at best. My friend, a French teacher, told me that she knew she was bilingual when she started dreaming in French. She wasn't translating anymore. She just knew. In our rapidly changing world, there are many ways that our familiar can be changing around us. 
unless we are non-binary, for example, we are always learning how to interact with non-binary language. That doesn't mean that we can't do it. It just means that we don't have the centered familiarity of someone who is fluent in the conversation. What I love about universalist practice is that we do not say, nope, that identity of yours is not right. You've misunderstood biology as I learned it in school 30 years ago. We say, what you are saying is unfamiliar to me. It's not the way I understand the world or have understood the world. And you matter to me. So I'd like to know how to be in caring community with you. This is my only point that I wanna make this morning. You matter to me. So I'd like to know how to be in caring community with you. There are lots of terms that people use as weapons that could have just been tools. And rather than try to define words infinitely, I'm going to offer up the idea that while definitions may shift, the universalist practice of all being saved is not the work of fixing people until they match our descriptions of what is right. It is the work of learning to set judgment aside so that we are welcoming to all. It's the work, it is the work of relaxing our certainty about what is for a more open stance where we might learn from one another with a freer interchange. But because we are people for who words have great meaning, I'm gonna go for a couple of quick definitions anyway. We hear the terms calling out and calling in used both as tools and weapons. So I'm going to attempt to frame them in a way that can help us. Calling out is to announce someone's transgressions. It is typically unforgiving. It's an announcement that someone has crossed a boundary and that the violation is grievous enough to go public. It can be a way of speaking truth to power. We call out politicians without hesitation. It can also be vindictive, a way of getting back at someone. It might, in a lesser way, just intend to embarrass someone. It often, in a harsher way, is meant to have a censuring effect. People call out other people in the hope of exposing their behaviors and changing the way they are viewed in the world. They might want someone to be criticized or exposed or fired or arrested or worse. Think back to the beginning when I asked you to imagine the ways that you have been or would have been in another time, the wrong people. Calling out may have happened to you or to your identity ancestors. It might happen in the form of bullying or abuse. It could be truthful, but mean-spirited, or it could be a lie. A false accusation is a particularly vicious form of calling out. Calling out still has an important role to play, naming a security risk, exposing lies, disrupting a cycle of abuse, Whistleblowing is a form of calling out. But for the most part, calling out is meant as a disruption. It is rarely used in the context of maintaining a relationship. It is meant to single someone out and doesn't intend to get them help, but rather to get them removed or, dare I say, canceled. Calling in, on the other hand, while it has echoes of calling out, is intended for the opposite purpose. The hope is to repair, preserve, or even just to begin to create a relationship. When there is a mistake, an injury, a transgression, or even sometimes intentional harm, calling in is the attempt to find a way to resolve the situation. 
if Henry offends Juliet without realizing it, Henry's friend might take him aside and explain what happened and help Henry to figure out a way forward. They might explain the mistake to Henry and Henry can learn for the future. They might suggest Henry speak to Juliet if there's a repair needed, but the goal is to create a better relationship and a better future. Henry, you're a jerk is a call out. Henry, what you said to Juliet may have come across as an insult and you might wanna see if you can repair it or at least not make that same mistake in the future is a call in. We've been teaching here at Westwood that when we misgender someone, when we say he, for instance, for someone who has asked us to use they pronouns, that a gentle correction is a helpful response. The correction might be, Fred uses they pronouns. We do it on the spot, in the moment, if there's no danger at hand. No matter how gently it's delivered though, being corrected can feel sharp. What is meant as a call in can feel like a call out. It's complicated. But waiting until the moment has passed, waiting until you're alone with someone might leave the injured person just hanging alone in the injury. It might be the worst harm waiting. And not saying anything can make us implicit in the injury that we just let it go by. We all have a lot to learn, I know I do, about how to make a correction in a way that truly calls people in and how a person receives a correction has a lot to do with the circumstances, with the relationships at play, with the power balance in the room and all the myriad other things impacting one's well-being. One of the tips we learned in a workshop was that if somebody gives you a gentle correction, Fred prefers they pronouns, rather than saying, oh, I'm sorry, to try saying thank you. To thank them for the gift of calling you into the relationship. It has totally transformed the way I feel when somebody points out that I've made a mistake. It's still not always easy, but starting to learn to say thank you when I learn something instead of sorry shifts the power dynamic completely. We're in this conversation because the work we're doing as a community and the growth we're undertaking and the ways that we're stretching, the ways we're working to engage reconciliation and to understand racism and gender identity, all of these things carry risks. All growth brings tenderness. Stretching can sting or burn. We know in the very simplest example that if we pull a child away from a fire, they're likely to cry. They're surprised, maybe embarrassed or angry, but they are also safer because of our effort they will recover more readily from being interrupted than they would from being burnt. It's obvious to us. It's not always so obvious to the person being interrupted, but it's one of the ways we can learn and grow. Caring enough to protect, to teach, to reassure someone, that isn't always easy or pleasant, but it's how we help one another to grow and how we demonstrate not by signaling our virtue, but by willing to risk someone's displeasure with us. It's how we care for the injured party in a transaction, how we show that we're in this together. And the resilience that we can develop through self-reflection, like learning to say thank you instead of I'm sorry, or, you know, buzz off, I don't wanna hear it. The resilience we can develop through confidence building, through loving support, can help us through these challenges. The strength that we can build through practice can change our lives.
you can see how there's no clear line between where calling out ends and calling in begins. That one can feel like one or the other to the person in the middle of it. But let's return to the one point of this service I want you to take away today, the message I hope that you carry with you. You matter to me. And so I'd like to know how to be in caring community with you. What you are saying might be new to me. Your understanding might not be the way I already understand the world. We might come from different cultures, philosophies, or beliefs, and you matter to me. So I'd like to know how to be in caring community with you. The essence of calling in, the essence of universalism, the essence of beloved community is to work on our relationships with one another to find ways in more than we look for ways out. There are always going to be times when that's not possible, not safe, not wise, times when we need to protect ourselves or protect others. But one important gift we all bring to community life is the effort we make to keep learning and growing, to make it welcoming, to make it as safe as possible, even for the wrong kind of people. Blessed be and amen. And now for our closing song, Break Not the Circle, played by Rebecca Patterson. I'm so grateful to sing with Rebecca so much this morning. Dan Emmons said, what needs most attention is the part of us that we seek to avoid feeling. When we have tended to that, we are changed and the world changes with us. So I'm going to give the last word to the Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie while we extinguish our chalices. Remind us for all, uh, remind us of how for all but five minutes of our history, we have been the wrong people. Help us to identify, name, and invite all the wrong people who may in fact turn out to be right. Show us those who need our invitation to participate in a whole and holy humanity. May your leadership be one of radical hospitality and inclusion.